Uh, first of all, Walt, I'd like you to just, for myself, for the viewers, give us your full name and talk about how you were involved in the military, where you're from. Mm -hmm. Okay. My name is Walter Sareko. I was originally from Herkimer, New York. And, uh, Why don't you speak right to me, okay? Don't even Herkimer, New York, and I uh, enlisted in October of 42. And I got out in January of 46. And I made three cruises, uh, and the combat cruises, uh, included 63 missions. And some of the medals I got on account of that, Distinguished Flying Cross, Air Medal, I'm going to stop you. Yeah, the coat. I've got the coat all. I got the coat all off. Yeah. yeah, it was kind of up my, here. My there. fault. I I'm almost. Sorry. I was just going to stop him. Isn't that funny? We both looked and said, "No, that's yeah. kind of." That's better. There we right. go. Because we kind of had one side up too far yeah. there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we want you to look in your Last spiffy thing I vest, somebody, right? How, is that better? Yeah. You got you all warm? You want to drink? I'm all right. No, I'm okay. okay. Yeah. That looks a lot better. I'm yeah. sorry. Yeah. Yeah, I noticed that I was going, I think I'm starting to count buttons there, Wade. It's, no, it's still oh. riding, but it's still riding up a little. I think it's just the way is that, that the it's sitting yeah. now. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it is. You know what part of it is because this is nice and flat because of the um, the yeah. metals. Yeah. So let me just pull this over and down. We hate to be uh We're tugging you at you. <laughs> that's yeah. that's the uh, uh yeah. price of uh stardom. <laughs> Being famous. Yeah. Okay. There we go. We are still rolling. Okay, that's okay. And uh, I ended up in boot camp in Sampson, New York, one of the first companies there. It was quite a cold winter on the lake there. And they used to get us out 2 o'clock in the morning if we misbehaved the wanted grinder and tramp around for an hour. We then got tired out, then we went back to the barracks. And after I got through with boot camp, they sent me to Memphis, Tennessee. And I went to Naval Ordnance School and Radar School, or Radio School, before I was shipped to Hollywood, Florida, a gunnery school. And from Hollywood, Florida, I went to uh, Sanford, Florida, and I was in PV twin engine bombers. Fortunately, I uh, never saw our torpedo bomber because I wanted to stay away from that type of plane because they were going down left and right. And I was told afterwards uh, when I got my orders to go to Pearl Harbor and uh, on the way down, we were, they put us on a destroyer. We had no place to sleep. We slept underneath the gun turrets or on you know, life boats, whatever we found us place we could sleep. And the galley was way down below decks. And I recall very vividly how I got down the chow line and the smell there. And by the time I got there, I felt like about ready to throw up. But I got my food. I put the tray down, but I grabbed my two pork chops, went on topside, heaved my guts out, and I ate the pork chop, and I was all right after that. And uh, we got to Maui, the, um, the Pearl Harbor. And they uh, gave me my orders, and I was quite happy about the orders because it says VT. And VTs, to me, was transports. That's what we learned in school. Well, they put us on a tugboat and took us about nine hours to get from Maui, uh, from uh, Oahu to Maui. And uh, next morning, I said to the chief, I said, where are the transports? And he said, what transport? There they are. And I never flew in a torpedo bomber. And we were first flight out uh, that I went in with this new pilot and the uh, thing I, we were on twin engines, we used to glide bomb would be about a 30 degree ang angle. And when we came about to do the first bomb drop, pilot said to me, he said, let me know where the bombs hit. So we wiggled our wings and flipped over back on their back and down in about a 75 degree dive. And then us, when you got pulled out, you felt you're going right through the turret. So he says to me, where did my bombs hit? I said, what bombs? <laughs> and he was quite upset. But I told him afterwards, there was no safety belt in that turret. And I was upside down when he uh, dropped the bomb. So I did not feel. So we went out. Uh, I went out on uh, 
two different ships. First one was the Enterprise, that was the most decorated ship in the war. And I spent seven months on that. And we had quite a number of um, attacks that we went on. One of the most memorable ones that I'll never forget was a night attack that we pulled from a carrier. We were the first ones to ever do that. And uh, we were pioneers in night bombing. And we went into this harbor and all of a sudden a flare went up and a hospital ship that was in a area there lit up and the whole area was lit up. So we made four separate runs and we had two hits on two different ships. But you could, nighttime you could see those trays was coming right at you. At uh, daytime you don't see that. And uh, we got over that and we and we ended up in Saipan and we went to Okinawa afterwards and we were bombing uh, the Japanese mainland, uh, Kiri Harbor we went into. We, uh, but the good part of after the war was over, they put us on Saipan for a couple of weeks before we had a ship to take us home. And we were able to go down in a, a different areas, look over some of the, oh, big caves that they had. There's a beautiful cave there where we were able to go swim. And if you had the guts, you can swim right out, on, out through the cave and come out to the ocean beach. And uh, I never did that though. I was chicken. And uh, when the war was over, we went uh, to the Yellow Sea. And that was beautiful because nobody was shooting at you and we were covering landings. And I was amazed to see Shanghai. What a beautiful city the waterfront was at that time and uh, we went all the way down to the northern part of China and flew over the Great Wall and we were told stay south of the 38th parallel and that was told by the Russians because they had the control above the 38th parallel so we kept our noses clean and we were there in that area. One of our guys uh, went down after we were over the Great Wall of China and the mountains uh, you know, I still think to this day that it was a put up job because they wanted to see something and uh, they had a ship's officer that went along for the ride for a sightseeing and over the mountains uh, it was plain to see that uh, there was, they weren't having any trouble and then all of a sudden I see the pilot jockeying his throttle back and forth and the first thing no communication so the radio man signaled with a signal light to us that they're going down. They picked out a beautiful rice paddy and made a nice landing there. And they were able to set the plane on fire and they spent uh, about 30 days there in, uh, uh, in Shanghai, or not Shanghai, whatever, in that yellow area there. And uh, we had a number of planes were shot down uh, over Truck Harbor. There was uh, two of our crews got shot down and uh, a submarine, the USS Tang, picked up a lot of the fellows there from uh, different ships that were, planes that were shot down. And uh, two of our crews, uh, one is from Binghamton, and I still see him, and uh, one of the fellows, anyway. So, and when we, it was all over, we gave us 30 days uh, leave but before we go on leave, they put us on Saipan and we were able to uh, spend two weeks there. And in that part of the cemetery there, we were able to go. I found some of the fellows from Herkimer uh, that I knew that were killed in, in their grave sites there. So that's about it. And uh, now I'm quite active in our little post that we have and uh, we uh, have only six, seven guys show up to meetings, but we still do quite a bit in the community. And How old were you, Walt, when you uh, first went to work? When I went in, I was 18. And then uh, went to boot camp at Samson and that was another, uh, I'm dreaming of a white Christmas that just came out. And of course, that would make you kind of homesick. And uh, we were in the canteen. And then uh, 
they asked anybody who wanted to go home for Christmas, um, you can sign up for submarine duty. You'll go home for Christmas. The rest of you will go home for New Year's. Well, I took New Year's. I couldn't see any part of a submarine. And I never thought I'd be flying in a torpedo bomber either because in training it was twin engines. And it was a, quite a big difference. And when we had our first live, uh, live bomb drop, uh, it was quite, a, quite different than I was used to. What, what were you feeling at that time? Well, really, if you didn't have time, too much time to think about yourself, of course, we always thought about home, and we always waited for mail call, which was sometimes 30 days apart, and you'd get about 15, 20 letters. Uh, and uh, I got a box of candy one time for, it was supposed to be at Christmas, but it was just a, a mush. And the only thing I salvaged from there was a fountain pen that somebody had uh, sent me. But uh, all in all, it was uh, quite an experience. What was the biggest thing you had to adjust to? Oh, I think the first few, after I got back home, uh, first month or two, just uh, getting back to peacetime and being free. And uh, then you'd have to, you couldn't think of where to go, so you end up in the bar and met some of the fellas there. We used to hang out, and uh, I was just so happy to be home. So, so you came home, and it was, did you think it was hard to adjust? Pardon? Was it hard to adjust coming home? Oh, first, first couple of months, yes, it was. It was so quiet, and uh, well, I guess uh, they told me afterwards that I was quite nervous, you know, and uh, my cousins would say, gee, you're not the same guy that I was when you left, you know, you know, when you go for three years, and uh, well, we were on three different, two different ships. The uh, Intrep is a museum in New York City now, and we had a reunion, squadron reunion in Newburgh two years ago, which I hosted, and we were able to go back uh, to the ship and a lot of the fellows, and, and that was 9-11 that time too. So the week uh, we had our reunion, they just opened up the ship and were able to go, uh, go aboard, and uh, we took a cruise, a circle line cruise around the city. But they only let us, uh, they only gave us a two hour cruise instead of three because it was off limits and you could still smell the smoke and everything going around in that area. So. Did, that, um, did that bring back any particular memories? I mean, that was a certainly uh, as horrible as war in many ways uh, when you were there. Yeah, uh, I couldn't believe it had happened for one. And seeing the, being in New York, different times and going around those buildings and so huge they were that they could disintegrate and come down like they did. It was unbelievable. When, uh, when you and the guys uh, get together, say when you got home, you get together, what, what are the things that you spent most of your time talking about? Well, we talked about where this guy was, where you were, each individual where we were, and uh, what we missed being home and uh, but we there's three of us that had a plan uh, that we made up we took girls names and this girl was Saipan this girl is Okinawa or this girl different areas so when we wrote letters to each other we had a general idea where they uh, were at years old when all of this mm -hmm. started and you were kind of thrown in the middle of it. Did you know much about the world at that time? No, well we saw a lot of it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So. Uh, how did you, uh, did you just, how did you learn quickly about it? About getting just, in. Just about the world, different places you were? Yeah, well we uh, went to so many places that we uh, learned how big the world was and uh, some of the memories that we had, like uh, where we had our beer parties off the ship, uh, you got two cans of beer, and uh, they would take about four or five hundred guys off the ship. We had about three thousand men, 
on the and you go out on the beach and uh, swim and ran, run into some of the other fellows there and it was quite a Ulithi was a place and they called it Magmag but it was it was good to get off the ship. Um, what do you think was uh, what was the hardest part for you during all of that? All that? Well, sometimes getting to bed. And uh, after, sometimes we flew twice, made two combat missions the same day. And uh, they were trying to keep us, uh, they had these little bottles, you know, about two ounce bottles there. If you flew that day, they give you one. And uh, kind of, you dozed off with it. Sleeping uh, still hard to do when you got back? No, it didn't take long afterwards, after I got quieted down some, yeah. What was life like during that time when you got back, just just different than now? What was life like in the Mohawk Valley when you came back? Well, we first, before we used to hang out, uh, some of the fellows never came back, so you miss those, and others that did come back, each. Each one had a story to tell, and uh, it was, well, it took time to get used to being nobody on your back. You go where you want, and uh, went back to work. And when the first time, after being at work for about a month, we they went on a strike. It was the old Remington Rand, and so, we walked the picket lines for six weeks, and we gained about three cents over the six-week period. <laughs> so, so you, so you were working at Remington then? Yeah. Tell us about yeah. that a little bit. Well, I was working on a, what they call line of time. Uh, it was a device they attached to a typewriter, and they would, uh, when you typed, you just move it, and the paper would go up or come down, I should say, or whatever. And uh, well, we always had good get-togethers. After lunchtime, we'd go out, have a beer or so, and would, uh, or sometimes we'd have these pork hocks, which were pickled pork hocks, and the guys would get a jar of them and we share them. Yeah. So you were working at the arms. Tell tell me a little bit of what you know about what was going on back home at the arms while you were at work. Well, I worked at a typewriter plant, not the arms. But I knew what was going on in the arms because my sister even worked in the arms uh, and some of the people were there producing uh, machine guns and things, gunnery parts. You said you said your sister. Tell me more about your family that was left home. Well, my brother, uh, when I got out, my brother joined the Navy, and he, and my other brother, younger brother, he went to Korea, Korean War afterwards, and uh, Joe went after he spent nine years in the Navy, he got home, and he had a eight months old boy, and that morning, one Saturday morning, going to work, he overslept, so he told the guys that were going to pick him up, go ahead. And uh, he went back up, woke the baby up, and started out to work. We worked in Utica Drop Forge. And as he come just out of Herkimer, crossing a little knoll there, a tractor trailer with four cars on it, jumped that center divider, hit him head on, and killed him there. And uh, yeah, he was 29. He had a being in a service and everything he had done. And he bought a big Buick, so things wouldn't happen, but they did, no matter how big it was. The guardrails held him and couldn't go anywhere. Yeah. That time at war always is a memory of an accident like that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I see on your hat that you're a chaplain. Yeah, I am a chaplain for two, two years, a chaplain of the county VFW. I'm still chaplain in our VFW post. And my other life is I'm a deacon in a Catholic church. I was ordained 20 years ago. So that keeps me busy, sick calls, funerals, and things. Uh, 
I know that in talking to some of the uh, others that many of them express uh, their faith and how their faith was a part of everything they talk mm-hmm. about. As a chaplain, I'm sure you've had to deal with that. What can you tell me about that? Well, we get a lot of calls that, uh, especially like when I do a wake service and consoling the families and, and especially it's hard if you know somebody, really know somebody, and uh, uh, you have to participate. But I've done that now over 20 years, so in fact, we're going to wake uh, tomorrow night. Earl on Johnson passed away. And uh, this thing, my eye, I'm, I get a blurry eye every now and then. It, um, I had, uh, well, 99, and, I got a cerebral hemorrhage, and uh, I was preaching at a church, and I felt a sharp pain, and then I got off the altar, and there's a PA there, and I got the ambulance right away, took me to Utica, same ease, and uh, then they put a shunt in my brain to draw off to some of the blood, and a couple of hours, a couple of day, a day later or so, they had to do a surgery. And uh, in the meantime, I had a couple of cardiac arrests, and they zapped me back both times. And uh, like this father Lamana came over, and uh, he blessed me with this relic of Padre Pio, and I came too. And uh, so here I am. I'm still going. Uh, they thought maybe I would have loss of memory and everything. Well, I did have. Basically, when I first got into therapy, they asked me where I lived. I said, well, I lived in Herkimer, and I was living in New Middleville at that time. And uh, But within a week or so, I was able to find, came, came all back to me. So what does it say about your faith? Well, I'm a great believer. And uh, you know, all you have to do is, when you have problems, just ask him, and you know, he'll keep you, keep you going. Yeah. Well, obviously, because you need to tell your story at this point. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, if you need, if you, if you saw a young person today and they, they just needed to know about the war, they needed to know about the what people have given for their country. Mm-hmm. What would you say to them? Well, we've gone to classrooms with some of the kids, and uh, they always want to know uh, what you did. And we would just tell them that that is something that we we don't care about, and not to think war, even like now. Uh, it's not a good good thing when you have to go through it. So just stay away. Don't think that way. Well, was it worth it at the time? Well, at that time, I think uh, you know everybody was ready to go anyway, you can join up. And uh, I know I, right after Pearl Harbor, I, we were down in General Herkimer, it was a beautiful day. And uh, General Herkimer home, a couple of us fellows were down there and uh, walking around the grounds when we heard on the radio. And so right away, well, they're gonna get us, so well, let's join up. But then I had a infected ear from tonsils and they would not take me right away, even though I was 17. But they here, you know, healed up, and I had no problem when I did join up a year later. Any regrets? No. I made it home, so that's the big, biggest part. Say that again, Mr. Uh, why don't you, would you, would you repeat that and just say, I, ha- I have no regrets? Pardon? Would you repeat that and use it as a sense? Instead of me asking you, did you have any regrets, would you just oh. say, I have no regrets? No, I don't. Can you say that in a sentence? I have no regrets. No, I don't have, I don't have any regrets about going into service. No. I see you're very decorated. Yeah, well, this is the New York State Conspicuous Medal. And this is my distinguished flying cross and the Air Medal China Service Medal and the Victory Medal. Yeah, I had, like I say, I completed 63 missions.
from two aircraft carriers. 62 missions, that's a lot of missions. Yeah. Um, and you told us a little bit about some of those ones. Um, what, is, uh, what do you think was your greatest victory? In the middle of all the combat, what, what felt like your greatest victory? Greatest victory is coming home under the Golden Gate Bridge. We knew at that time we knew we were home. Yeah, that was the greatest feeling. Yeah, because we, uh, all the big celebrations that went on, you saw them on television and everything else, but we never were in part of that because we didn't get back until uh, late November. So we missed uh, good times with their celebration they're having all over the cities. Think about the the wartime. Um, gosh, if you if you learned anything about it, you said, "Oh, coming home was great." Yeah. What did you learn about home? Well, we learned what they got went through, with no sugar and no grease and different things. What the hardship that were at home too. And we learned about that, and of course, we didn't realize anything like that. What was going on? because we had too many other things to think about. Uh, what did you learn about your country? It's a great country. And, uh, and they took care of us. They still do. Uh, what do you think, uh, what do you think a, a young person should know? Uh, if I ask my kids, uh, one of my children at one point asked me, Mommy, what's a Nazi? The Nazis? What do little kids need to know to pass on to other generations? Yeah. Well, I guess they learned about the Nazis. There's, there's not much in the history books about any, uh, any things today about the Nazis or Japanese or anything. There's, the history books are not, don't have anything. What should they be telling us? Well, I think basically that we're happy to live in this country and be proud of it. Was it all worth it? Yes, I think it was. I mean, it was worth it. Time where Spent away, but uh, we got back and uh, we realized there was a lot more to it going on home than we thought because we were doing our thing and what was happening home, the hardships that they faced. Um, what, uh, how much of a family did you leave here at home? You said your, your youngest brother had gone to Korea. Yeah. I had uh, two brothers. When I got out, Joe went into the Navy. He was in the Navy, and he's the one that got killed afterwards. And the younger brother, uh, he went. He was in the Korean War. He was a medic in the Korean War. Now, when he went into war, how did that make you feel? Well, when I got out, Joe went in, and uh, at that time, war was over, and. I kind of thought that, you know, it's not going to happen right away again. So uh, I was proud of them, both of them brothers. Now, after you got home, what about a family? Have you built a family through the years? Well, we got married and we have I got a son. The son is in uh, oh, Overland Park, Kansas now. And he went to Villanova and got his master's degree, degree in Penn State. And he got a job as the Model Cities pro program in Austin, Texas as an administrator. And that kind of, well, it took him, he'd have about three months work and the rest of the time, everybody, nothing to do. So he got tired of it and he resigned from it. And he went to, wrote a couple of books. In the meantime, then he, went to uh, Orkin Pest Control 
and got a job with them. So they went ahead and, uh, of course, he was crawling underneath, uh, learning all the ropes, being an executive, and uh, exterminating rattlesnakes and things. And finally, he got tired of it because they uh, he moved to California to open up a branch there. And he ended up all the time flying once a week, he'd be flying to Atlanta, Georgia headquarters. And he got tired of that because he had th three kids and uh, he didn't want no part of it. Fifth grandchildren. Yeah. And uh, now we have a uh, great grandson, two, two years old. We expect a grand new great granddaughter March 11th, they're expecting. Yeah. What do you want your great grandchildren to remember about what great grandpa did in your life? Well, we didn't have that much time to get together with them because they were always on a go. Like Fran was in um, Austin, Texas, then he went to, oh, he went end up out to the West Coast in the San Bernardino and, uh, area, and then he, uh, Bismarck, North Dakota, and he said he'd never come uh, back here. It's just too cold, and Bismarck was the coldest spot in the country. <laughs> And uh, they had 26 inches of snow. That was, and that was for the year. And I said, well, we get, we get that in one snowstorm. But he's in Overland Park now in uh, Kansas. So what do you want those kids to know? Well, all I want them to know that, well, we had shared a little time with them. That, and they always to remember us. We're getting older, and uh, that's about it. Have you talked to your family about your memories from the war? Oh, yeah, yeah. Your son knows about? Yeah, yeah, because he got, in fact, this. Well, show us some of the things you have. For yeah. This is uh, the Buzzer Brigade. That's our history of the squadron and the uh, things that we did, the whole squadron, over the years. And even though I dropped in torpedoes, I never was on a torpedo bomber raid. We only made one, and the rest of the time we're dive bombing all the time. So this covers a lot. And this is my crew. Myself, Charlie Henderson, and Will Schmeckley. Charlie was quite a pilot. He uh, should have been a fighter pilot. I was with him. We pulled out of a cloud and a Japanese plane ahead of us. So he chased and shot it down. And I had another, we were searching for the Japanese fleet. And I spotted a bogey, which we called an IF aircraft. And so Charlie says, Charlie, ho, and he chased us to a place where we about 50 feet above the water for quite a while before we caught up with him. And, and when he expended all his ammunition, he said, he's all yours, and he turned so I could move my turret. But I said, I, I don't have to do anything. He went down. So he, he ended up with uh, four, uh, four kills as a, with a torpedo bomber and a possible fifth one. And then he went into salvaging, and uh, I guess he got the bends and they killed him. And he was in some of the places there, salvaging ships and so forth. And this is a little plaque that I was installed. I was installed uh, in this enlisted combat air crew hall of honor in November 2001. And that's a Patriot Point on Yorktown. The Yorktown is there as a part of the museum that's over there. Pardon? some other treasures in there? No. Those are in the 
Oh, oh, that was my that book there is uh, my log book that has all the information about where I was, all the fights that I had. Can you hold that up and turn it around? Yeah. 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 And that explains who I flew with, what type of what type of mission it was, and this particular page I was in the twin engine. This was training missions. There was a twin engine bomber that I flew in, and like I say, I never saw a torpedo bomber until I after I got from got from uh, Pearl Harbor to Maui. Well, this was just in the paper recent, not too long ago. Uh, that was uh, looking back. That was when I first came. Uh, after my first combat home. And I, that proves one thing, I had all my fingers at that time. Well, if you would, could you put, if you're done with the bag, yeah. you put that all down and then just point to your medals again? Yeah, yeah. I was going to ask that another question about the medals. Yeah. We'll do those medals one at a time. Okay. Hold the bottom of your toes down. There you go. That one turned around? Yeah, yeah there, that yeah. one looks a little bit better. Oh, that's a distinguished flying cross. Start, start right up at the top and go through the order you did before. Oh, those are my wings that we had. And this one here is a New York State Conspicuous Medal. Okay. And this is a distinguished flying cross. And this is the Air Medal. And this is the Asiatic Pacific Medal. And this is the uh, victory medal. Which of those means the most to you? Well, like one of them, I just recently after that was published, uh, that picture there uh, was published, I got, it says, well, I guess you're a hero. And I said, it proves one thing, I had all my fingers at that time. So. Why don't you show us your shirt, Walt? Now that's our. Oops. I'm going to just pull this mic cable yeah. out of the way there for a second. How about that? That's our, the Buzzard Brigade. That was our squadron insignia. The old vulture. And some of the, some of the friends still call me an old buzzard. Yeah. What, is there any other memory or any other thing that you think you'd love to hang on to or you'd love to just tell somebody and have them just hold on to it? Just a second. Okay. Uh, Mike, I want to read a shirt. And, and no, I don't think so. Okay. Yeah. Before you answer that, Walt, let's yeah. just do this quickly. He doesn't either. Yeah. Okay. No, I don't think so. feel good about what you've let people know. Oh, yeah. Good. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Great to be here. It is great you. to have you. Thank it's you. It's been my pleasure. Say your name and where you're from.